Lawrence mm. Jangawashira, a medical doctor by training and also a trained clinical psychologist. Today I am going to be discussing sex addiction in the Break Free series. So sex addiction is um, actually uh, controversial in terms of the um, diagnosis in the medical field. However, there is actually um, a phenomenon where you can find yourself in activity or actions that feel like you're addicted to sex. And what is an addiction? An addiction basically means you're in a situation where there's a particular activity or thing that captures your mind to the extent that you've lost control. In addition, you may find yourself having uh, excessive thoughts or desires or urges or um, you're spending so much time in the activity or the behavior to um, attend to that specific uh, action or thing, for example, a drug, that you feel like you're enslaved to it. So that is the definition of an addiction. And this can also happen in the uh, setting of sex, where you find yourself having such excessive desires or urges that you're constantly thinking about sex, about uh, the, the activity that you want to do or actually spending so much time in the actual activity or in preparation for the activity to the exclusion of others such that you are um, either um, not spending adequate time in other activities that you'd regularly take time in or you're, you're doing this even though it is harmful to yourself or harmful to others. So at the point where the, there's loss of control and there's uh, harm or there's exclusion of what is uh, your normal quote-unquote behavior, then we call that an addiction. So um, how, what I have described is how you would know that you're a sex addict. So this is, um, the, how this forms is interesting because in the natural uh, sense, sex is pleasurable. But in the setting of sex addiction, this bus of pleasure sort of override uh, other um, normal brain function. So how an addiction develops is, um, say you, you take some anything that you do on a normal day to make you feel good. So for example, if you listen to music that you like, or you eat a particular food that you enjoy, there is a, there, there's a, a series of uh, events that happen in the brain and then some chemicals are released that make you feel good. Um, in the setting of something that causes addiction, what is released is so much such that it uh, ends up causing a change in how that uh, circuitry works so that the body um, usually reduces the number of receptors. This, these are the parts, the, the, the parts that receive the chemical trans neurotransmitter that's released. So the body naturally, when you release enough of a neurotransmitter, then it has a way of reducing that interaction so that um, either it's retained as normal or it, it, it doesn't extend for too long at, in a hyper state. But when um, there's too much of the, that produced, so in the case of something that causes an addiction, then the body reduces the number of receptors for the neurotransmitter because it feels that too much is being produced. So you find that what would normally make you happy, those small bursts, like for example, from good music or from good food, those small bursts of um, happiness then stop being enough because you've reduced the number of receptors for those neurotransmitters. So you need a lot more to achieve the same level of happiness. And even with that same um, substance or that same activity, with time, you need more and more of it, either in terms of duration or in terms of intensity or variety just to achieve the same level of excitement or the same level of happiness. Um, so that's how an addiction develops. So you need more and more of the thing to, to make you happy, so to speak.
So how can you know that the pattern you have is uh, leading to sexual addiction or how do you know that you have landed in sexual addiction? Uh, the first one is if you feel that your thoughts, your desires and urges are excessive. Secondly, you feel that you've lost control. You're not able to hold yourself back or to um, wait until a particular time or a particular setting for you to be able to satisfy these sexual urges. Thirdly is when you're spending so much time that either you find yourself getting late to work or getting late to school or you're not sleeping at night or there are other activities that you've completely um, eliminated from your day just so that you can spend time doing this or you may find yourself exerting so much effort just to gratify that uh, sexual urge to the extent that for example you may start looking for people to pay for sex with or um, going to, um, to to do to places or to activities that would you would not normally do in addition you would say you have sexual addiction if Either you have experienced harm or you are aware of the harm it can cause you, but you still continue regardless. This may be harm to your health, this may be harm to your relationships, it may be harm to your career, to your studies, or it may even be that you're spending a lot of money on that specific uh, behavior and yet you continue to do so. It's also harmful if what you're doing or contemplating doing is actually illegal, so it would cost you in that way. So. If you find yourself in such a state, then you would know that you have landed in sexual addiction. So what would lead to sex addiction? Um, so there may be a few contributory factors, some of which may be um, if you have a medical condition that leads to excessive production of some hormones that lead to excessive sexual activity that seems to be uncontrolled. There are also psychological disorders that may contribute to this. For example, the mood disorder called bipolar. So during the manic phase of bipolar disorder, someone has uh, less control over what they do and they usually end up doing a lot of uh, risky activities. For example, having sex with multiple people, driving too fast, and uh, this can lead to um, excessive sexual activity. You may also have, uh, you may also develop sexual addiction because you're using it as a way to medicate yourself when you have depression or anxiety. So when you get, uh, you have low mood because of depression, then you end up um, participating in sexual activity as a way to give yourself a high. And then once you come down from the high, maybe you feel bad about your choice of partner or the activity that you engaged in, which worsens the low mood, which leads you again to further sexual activity, which becomes a cycle that then becomes addictive. You may also have um, sexual addiction developing as a result of either emotional issues or uh, challenges with uh, social interaction, or it may also be a result of trauma, especially trauma that um, happens in childhood, uh, especially sexual abuse. So if a person has uh, sexual addiction, then what can they do? Where can they get help? So you can um, speak to any mental health professional. There are uh, mental health professional, uh, professionals available as either private practitioners or uh, in groups of practices or in uh, institutions that are um, present in any town um, that you are in. There are also mental, mental health professionals in all uh, of the larger hospitals, both the public and the private hospitals. And they're usually available at a cost that is similar to the cost of other consultation uh, costs for other services. So if you walk in to any um, clinic where there's a mental health professional, most of the time you do not even need an appointment, you just walk in. For those who are below the age of 26 and maybe live in Nairobi, there is um, a youth center in Kenyatta National Hospital that will offer services for free for um, any adolescent or young person. Um, so you, once you find uh, that professional, um, usually after an evaluation, either they will offer psychotherapy or they'll refer for medical treatment or they will en en engage you in a support group. So for psychotherapy, 
uh, this is talk therapy that addresses the underlying issues that may be leading to the sex addiction, the actual behaviors around the sex addiction and the thoughts um, and the urges that lead to it and also any consequences um, in case they can be managed through the behavior change. Then there's also uh, the support groups where people come together and actually encourage each other even as they journey through the recovery from the addiction. And there's even a Sex Addicts Anonymous group that you can be directed to by the mental health professional. There are also medications that may be given for, um, especially for the underlying illnesses that may be contributing to the sex addiction. For the Christian, um, or the person who chooses to seek help in Christian circles, there are actually psychologists in a lot of the, uh, of the larger uh, churches and most of them, if not all, offer services for free. And most of them also have um, uh, toll-free lines that you can call uh, either through the church or directly that would connect you to the mental health professional who's also a Christian. So in the Christian circles, this, uh, the topic of sex addiction is not an easy one to uh, discuss or tackle because, I mean, it's, it's embarrassing and um, it's not one we are used to. However, we need to, as Christians, be able to recognize and call out uh, habits that are harmful uh, to our brothers and sisters. And for you to be able to do this, you need to be able to initiate honest and uh, loving conversations where there is no judgment and where every party can be vulnerable and be able to express themselves honestly. And um, once this person has uh, confided in their in their challenge, if they need, um, and most of the time they may need, if they need professional assistance, kindly reach out to the mental health professional in your circles or um, in the hospitals or other places so that this person can get professional help. But in addition, you need to assist this person to walk through, uh, walk the path of recovery. So for any addict, we say that they need to first begin by choosing to reach that point uh, of change where they decide that they want to uh, to actually start the journey towards uh, making a difference in their lifestyle. Then um, as part of the recovery process, they actually need to avoid the places, the people and the objects that they were using or that would trigger um, thoughts of uh, the addictive behavior or, uh, or, or substance that they were using before. So if you're going to avoid the people and the places and the things that were leading to the addictive behavior, then of course you need to uh, replace them with something else that is healthier. So for example, if it's people and there are particular people who are uh, either you're engaging the behavior with or who would uh, stimulate conversations that lead you in a particular path, then you would need to uh, spend time with people who, first of all, are maybe aware of your challenge and secondly, who would then be having conversations or activities that are away from the uh, sexual addiction. Secondly, in terms of places, uh, sexual addiction may take the form of either engaging in um, excessive masturbation, watching pornography a lot, or having sex with uh, people, but either multiple sexual partners or um, in situations that are dangerous. So for the places then, it would mean that if the issue is pornography and masturbation and you find yourself alone a lot of the time, then you would need to be in places where there are other people so that you're not alone a lot of the time. And when you're alone, then you also need to have additional activities that take your attention and you need to commit to them. It may be exercise, it may be reading, it may be volunteering or uh, doing something that helps somebody else. But as long as it takes your energy and your time so that you're not uh, having free time to engage in this activity, then that would be helpful. Um, friends, friend groups can also um, create activities that um, spy each other, I mean, spy each other to love and good works and actually do things that help others so that you have to spend time creating the activity and then doing it or um, even playing sports together or engaging in drama or music or dancing that takes your time and uh, engages your mind as well. 
at the same time you may actually choose to um, have uh, filters or apps that uh, block uh, pornographic uh, websites from popping up in your in your devices you may also choose to link these apps to somebody else so that they get an alert anytime you try to access uh, those websites so um, also in terms of the things while you may not for example be able to say that you'll get rid of your phone or your laptop or um, an iPad but maybe you can make sure that you only use them for particular um, either a particular time duration and actually put a timer that uh, then switches off the device um, or you can actually put them away so that you say, for example, when I go home, I leave my machine somewhere so that I do not have access to it when I'm alone. So um, in addition to all this, we need to also um, spend time in the word of God because what you feed is what will grow. So if you spend a lot of time in material that then leads you to sexual activity, you need, it will be helpful to replace this with life-giving material, whether it's a Bible or other Christian literature or other uh, material that actually builds you up. In addition to all of this, you need to pray because this is still a type of bondage. And as Galatians 5.1 says, it's for freedom that we've been set free. Do not enslave yourself. Um, and the, there is power in the blood of Christ to set you free from this bondage. Thank you.